Um, and what I'm going to speak about today is how progressive social movements have actually contributed to this kind of place, you know, uh, this kind of carcerality uh, and security state that we find ourselves in today. Starting with, of course, you know, Miss Denny Yang rape in 2012, which we all know about. Her young woman was brutally raped, and she died of her injuries. Um, and a young man was also beaten and lay on the ground with a broken leg, no one actually helping him. Uh, their bodies dumped near Delhi's uh, listening in New International Airport. What's important, as you all remember, maybe, that there was a, the event triggered a spontaneous protest all over the country, mostly in metropolitan cities. And also throughout the world, there was lots of anger. Uh, and a committee was set up, the um, Badma Committee, to propose amendments to the criminal law. The recommendations, although a bit over the top and trying to deal with far too many things, um, were in fact nevertheless bold and they sought to confront sexual violence through the discourse of rights, rights, which is the language that we're losing completely today. Um, poor grounding the rights to bodily integrity, sexual autonomy, and legalizing adult consensual sexual relationships. These are really bold moves. Um, and the position therefore challenged outdated, outdated notions of Indian womanhood, which was based on chastity, conservative sexual morality, honor, marriage, heterosexuality, and purity, which has framed almost all discussions on women's rights and laws dealing with sexual rights in post-colonial India. So it marked a really significant shift towards rights rather than wrongs as far as women were concerned. The call for uh, a marital rape law and opposition to the demand for death penalty in cases of sexual sexual violence were also significant recommendations. As we all know, the Criminal Law Amendment Act was passed by Parliament where many of the key recommendations that would have advanced women's rights to gender equality and respect for women were simply ignored. Re the definition of rape was expanded um, and in important directions. Uh, however, the imposition of the death penalty where uh, rape leads to the death of the victim or permanent maiming, uh, sorry, maiming uh, the retention of Victorian provisions dealing with the outraging of, the wo of a woman's modesty, and most importantly, the exemption of marital rape from the purview of the criminal law were uh, the outcome of all of this activity. What I, what I suggest uh, as a result of analyzing this, this amendment is that the new law really set up a legal edifice focused primarily on security, sexual surveillance, and law and order, and left intact dominant gender arrangements, which were based on discrete categorizations of male and female, as well as once again a conservative understanding of female sexuality as passive, as vulnerable, and encased in the stultifying interpretation of Indian cultural values. At the same time, what it also did, and this is going on around the world, is it augmented the muscular power of the state to regulate and discipline the sexual behavior of its citizens in the direction of fewer rights and more surveillance. One sort of small representation of uh, surveillance is to install CCTV cameras in buses and also have police, more police presence at the uh, bus stands. Here's the compelling question. Why is it over three decades of women's human rights advocacy, how is it that after three decades of women's human rights advocacy, did this appalling episode of violence against woman, women come to be articulated within stable categories of gender and invite state intervention in the form of criminal justice, stringent, stringent sentencing, and a strengthened sexual security regime? Uh, I just want to, just a small um, aside, all four were prosecuted under the old law, and it worked, right? And so you have to ask, then why do we need all this new law? Um, so coming back to the three points I want to make in the talk today. First, I discuss how the carceral and sexual security regime produced by the Delhi rape is in part informed by ways, by the way in which gender and the gendered other have been pr predominantly addressed in international law and women's human rights advocacy. That gives us the context. Second, I want to trace the work that gender does in the area of international human rights and how it facilitates the rise of a sexual security regime. And I focus on three areas. I might not do all of these because they're so brief, but depending on the time, anti-trafficking, wartime rape, and the Rome Statute that set up the International Criminal Court, and the UN Security Council resolutions on gender, peace, and security. 
And thirdly, I return to the case of the Delhi rape to locate carceral feminism within the neoliberal term, uh, which we haven't really talked about much so far uh, in, in the previous sessions, and to illustrate how gender works with market interests in ways that are not necessarily emancipating, but nevertheless constitute our new definitions of freedom. Uh, and the question then becomes, can gender ever be a force for progressive change? Uh, gender in the international, let's just look at the context. The dominant narrative of gender in, um, I just say, international human rights law, IHL, is based on the reproduction of the idea of sex as a stable natural category, and gender as socially constructed, that can be altered and manipulated. Now this dichotomization has informed feminist advocacy as well as the United Nations work in the area of what's called women's rights, uh, which continue to operate along a nature-nurture divide. This dominant narrative of sex and gender was initially put into crisis by the work of famous political uh, feminist theorist Judith Butler, who focused on sex as discursively and culturally produced in and through gender, rather than as something that's naturalized and pre-existing, uh, a naturalized pre-existing body. And she recast gender, quite controversially, as a repetitious performance simultaneously of the enactment, as well as a constant re-experiencing of a set of meanings that are socially attached to gender. Um, you know, it, it, going into a store, you'll see there's the men's section and the women's section. And the minute you go to the men's section, it's, no, 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 you won't go over there. And it, that's one example of it. Or adver advertisements that reproduce gender stereotypes. Gender is an apparatus through which sex is produced and rendered as pre-discursive and normal, according to Butler. Um, uh, queer theorists then subsequently have challenged the ways in which sex and sexuality have emerged in human rights advocacy within the universal dynamics of what's now called the gay international um, human rights movement. They expose the specific ways in which men who have sex with men, MSM, have been essentialized in this universalizing dynamic that has pushed through the LGBT rights as universal human rights at a global level. As some scholars explicitly point out, the focus on identity in LGBT uh, advocacy promotes a dominant model of Western sexuality that is underpinned, again, by gender dichotomization, men and women, masculine and feminine, male and female, as well as a hetero and homosexual binary. It also reduces the multiplicity of sexual identities and practices elsewhere in the world as a result of what's now called the imperialism of the global gay, how to be gay in the world. These critiques have all been valuable in understanding how gender, sex, and sexuality is structured within IHL. At the same time, the analytical insights of post-colonial feminism also enable us to understand how, gen how the gendered other is constructed. While male and female bodies have been overwhelmingly understood in the international legal arena as naturally <coughs> different, these bodies have been further displaced onto what's a first world and third world divide, which operates to reinforce civilizational differences and cultural superiority of the West and the primitiveness of the other. This difference has been constructed against definitions and assumptions about colonial masculinity, uh, femininity, culture, and historical difference, as well as what and who constitutes the universal subject. These assumptions about culture, gender difference, and the other continue to inform the contemporary moment and how human rights becomes the new savior of victims from savages. We see this representation most explicitly in responses to women, for example, in Europe who wear the veil. And this has uh, been accentuated in the post 9-11 era where there's been this aggressive response in some Euro European countries to ban certain manifestations of the veil which have been upheld uh, by the European Court on Human Rights, uh, most recently on the grounds of being able to live together, even though that's not a grounds in the convention. The choice of the veiled woman is set against the coercive actions of the liberal democratic state that forces her to choose between the veil and participation in public life or access to state education, <coughs> when in fact what she wants is both. Gender equality comes to be associated with the unveiled body non-freedom with the veiled body. Tradition and antiquity, cast as primitive and serving libidinous desires, are used to make moral <coughs> judgments about the native subject or the other. 
and such a focus not only reinforces the image of the other woman as victims, but also the idea of culture as an inherently negative feature of the third world. It also uses culture to deflect attention away from some of the systemic ways in which women's human rights are being undermined, for example, through current neoliberal economic processes. Gender remains this noun as something to be rescued by the universalizing project of human rights rather than a verb that works to reinforce the first world, third world divide and distinctions between us and them, men and women. Postcolonial feminists have then exposed how gender, the gender and other is often viewed as even more victimized, vulnerable, and in need of protection than her first world counterpart. And this has, of course, very serious implications for the strategies that are subsequently adopted to remedy some of the harms that women experience. And that is invariably focusing on rescuing women from the native man through stringent punishment, incarceration, and most importantly as well, further cultural stigmatization. Uh, the critique really rejects the dominant understanding of gender and sex as stable, and naturalized, and normalized, biologically embedded practices. It argues that gender takes many diverse forms and exists outside of Western-specific models. Despite, however, the problematizing of these categories of gender and sexuality, as well as culture, by queer, feminist, post-colonial scholarship, women's human rights advocacy, both domestically as well as internationally, continues to reinforce gender and sexuality as stable and essentialist categories, and this has specific consequences. Let me turn to the second point, which is the security discourse and regulation, disciplining, and management of gender in international human rights. Uh, so I want to now use these critical insights on gender that I've just discussed to move away from the idea of gender as a noun and instead to trace what work is gender doing in some of this human rights advocacy, women's human rights advocacy in particular. Let's first look very quickly at sex trafficking uh, in international human rights law. The, the international human rights arena, in, in the international human rights arena, gender has been framed largely within the violence against women's campaigns. That's not what it was meant to be. In 1993, that's what it became. So it was all about violence against women rather than about rights, human rights of women. And that is something that states wholeheartedly endorse, which needs to make you very suspicious. Why were they doing this? Because, of course, it immediately meant they could turn to the criminal law to try and look good on gender, but also enhance their own power. Um, this approach has been very evident in anti-trafficking interventions ever since the 1990s that have been invariably conflated with anti-sex uh, work as well as anti-migrant agendas. They are the casualties of the anti-trafficking uh, uh, advocacy. The protocol on trafficking in persons in 2000 was, in, it was intended to extend beyond specific issues of prostitution. Um, but they've been used, unfortunately, by feminists and the state actors to adopt laws that criminalize various components of the, of the sex industry and once again reinforce the notion of women as victims without agency, uh, especially third world women and facilitating, again, increased surveillance power over cross-border movements, you know, strengthening of border controls and the presence of border personnel, police personnel, um, uh, at, at the borders. These responses demonstrate an increasing obsession with national security, law and order, border protection. In the context of globalization and free market ideology, I think we have to keep that context in mind. It's not just the state doing this because it's just accumulating more power, it's also alongside the intensification of the, and, and, uh, of, of the neoliberal agenda. Uh, and, and really, really not about the protection of women from traffickers and smugglers. So the anti-trafficking interventions partly illustrate how an entire regulatory regime can be established without necessarily addressing the problem that triggered its establishment, the exploitation of and violence against women who move or are moved across borders by clandestine networks of smugglers and traffickers. The interventions, in fact, produce an edifice that may be missing the point altogether. As in the case of the Delhi rape, such interventions did not and have not empowered women, but in fact, have strengthened the state regulatory apparatus, the criminal justice system, and intensified the sexual surveillance of women's lives. Turning quite briefly again to gender in the International Criminal Court, 
Um, in the processes of drafting the Rome Statute, there was a phenomenal feminism. There were about 200 feminist groups that were present. Uh, and they quite single-mindedly, once again, focused on trying to prohibit rape in war and prosecute it vigorously. So once again, endorsing the sort of criminal approach to women's human rights. Uh, gradually, the feminist focus expanded to cover not only rape in the context of war in relation to belligerent uh, forces, but to view these things as part of a bigger global war against women. So the language of war, the language of, you know, um, uh, of criminal law, the language of extreme punishment are part of the discourse of progressive groups. The argument was that the acceptability of rape in peacetime causes rape in conflict. This is sort of this causal connection without any attention to context. Uh, and based on a capacious understanding or conception of male domination, where rape was reimagined as part of a bigger male war against women. There's only one cause. Quite specifically, quite specifically, feminists wanted the ICC to have unlimited jurisdiction over sexual harms. It didn't get that, but that's what they wanted. Um, the goal was to address sexual violence through tougher criminal law responses, demanding more stringent sentences, making sex crimes, a uh, specific set of indictable offenses. The goal is to be partly achieved by using repressive, uh, the repressive apparatus of the state to alter or eliminate a specific kind of behavior that harms women. And this harm can range from violent gang rape to sexually colored remarks to everything in between. I mean, that's really quite repressive and really quite curtailing of, uh, of, of a rights agenda. Uh, the end result is not only an alignment of progressive actors with the coercive aspects of the state regulatory structure, but also further entrenchment of gender arrangements where women are victims and men perpetrators in the context of war and conflict, regardless of the political, cultural, historical context and, and economic context, and of a conservative sexual morality where sex is per se considered as something that's dirty, unclean, and from which good and decent people need to be protected, and bad behavior incarcerated. Uh, it's a highly moralistic agenda, conservative moralistic agenda. And then finally, the Security, the security Council resolutions on gender, peace, and security. It, it, they um, were designed to integrate women into the peace process in conflict and post-conflict contexts. Specifically, in quotes, encouraging the Secretary General to increase the participation of women at decision-making levels in conflict resolution and peace processes, and ensure the full, equal, effective participation of women at all stages. I might take a few minutes extra, if you're okay with that. Because yeah? I do want to make my neoliberal point. Okay. Um, uh, the, anyway, the, the Security Council resolutions were placing a strong emphasis on just getting women at the table, not necessarily speaking at the table. Um, but also mainstreaming gender throughout the UN system, which basically meant the actually eliminating gender difference and gender inequality in the process of mainstreaming. Uh, I'm going to skip to um, uh, just a quick summary of this. Um, what's important about gender, peace, and security, once again, represents women that should be at the table because they're nurturing, caring, gentle, they'll be really good in these kind of complex situations, again, essentializing uh, gender attributes. Women's groups and human rights groups have continued to imagine that the international national legal orders are heavily consolidated in this top-down understanding of sovereign power, focusing considerable attention on the criminal justice, law and order, and security apparatus. And by continuing to appeal to the state, which we constantly do, domestically and internationally, what they're doing is failing to attend to the consequences of such a strategy. And therefore, they're emerging more as a technocratic enterprise rather than a radical political movement uh, that facilitates and legitimates, legitimates uh, normative understandings of gender and, again, strengthening the state's power over uh, regulating uh, and, and surveying, disciplining gender. I want to just look at the um, gender in the context of the neoliberal term, which I think is needs to be understood as the context within which this turn to the criminal law and carcerality is happening. By look, revis let's revisit the, the rape of, uh, of Jyoti Singh Pande, wh who, whose aspirations had inspired millions of women in this country, right? Uh, she had come from a lower income bracket. She was working to earn enough to help her 
her siblings through uh, their school as well. It was an image of the aspiring Indian woman making a place for herself in the global economic order. And, and the collective presence of outraged young women on the Indian street after the rape marked a significant moment in the effort to inscribe the new generation within the neoliberal schema of gender. That was the new understanding of freedom, right? Freedom of choice within these neoliberal economic lifestyles. It challenged, and it's, uh, it, uh, I'm not entirely critical of this, because it challenged and defied traditional understandings of Indian womanhood and its accompanying stereotype positions about male, female, femininity, and masculinity. Audaciously declaring, I am not just your mother, daughter, sister, or wife, I'm a citizen and I demand equal rights. Some of the placards on the streets overtly distant themselves from the familial understandings of Indian womanhood that has really shackled women's freedom in India ever since independence. So these slogans, slogans are really a powerful reminder of how in every crisis rights are crucial for according recognition in law as well as in the public arena. But the problem is it's not self-evident that this kind of, this kind of position um, emerged as part of a counter-hegemonic radical political agenda uh, that reshaped gender norms and behaviors. In fact, the protests on the Delhi streets and elsewhere may have, as, as Greg, you had maybe mentioned, marked the arrival of a certain form of agency and female autonomy, which you say is part of the attributes of freedom, that appear to be free, or at least freer than earlier, but it is, in fact, fairly constituted within the parameters of neoliberal political rationality, which today provides the dominant contemporary frame for sovereignty within the context of gender and sexuality. Now, while this may be a more emancipated new generation that's invested in competing and consuming and experiencing its sovereignty without censorship or the interference of the bloated state apparatus, it somewhat paradoxically continues to appeal to the state to ensure the stability and security to facilitate the exercise of this freedom. In other words, make sure we get to pull from point A on the bus to point B, our place of work, without any hassles. And whatever you have to do to do that, you know, do it. It's not necessarily about rights. At the same time, this freedom is embedded in the idea of the self-sufficiency of the individual and, su success and successful competition in the marketplace and the seductive and erroneous notion that the market is a space of free choice and inherently not coercive. Okay, so just to um, maybe try and conclude here, um, the security apparatus that was strengthened in light of the protests were partly propelled by market demands for stability and efficiency and hence greater policing. And in some ways, the interests of the protesters and the state uh, coincided in the sexual surveillance techniques and carceral measures that were ultimately adopted. And this convergence, convergence perhaps represents justice for women who are, in fact, exhausted from being pawed and groped and ogled in the public realm. But it also operates as a disciplining technique of modern power and a condition of legibility. The discussion raises, I think, very important questions about the possibility of, change, of, of gender and change through human rights. When the idea of state sovereignty is unpacked, and the processes of international human rights are exposed as already pursuing normative understandings of gender, does this not limit the possibility of realizing freedom, emancipation, and empowerment? Let me stop there. I did want to mention that some of the stuff I've been uh, presenting today is also part drawing from my uh, a book that I'm doing that's coming out by Edward Elder Press, um, and it's called Gender, Alternity, and Human Rights. Uh, the um, so the title is, Yes, Freedom in a Fishbowl, uh, and it will be coming out in early in 2018.